everyone, my name is Deanna Robitaille, District Advisor with PVR, cover most of the Northeast Kingdom. Benton Mitchell, also with PVR, used to be an Emmerich employee. I do Northwestern Vermont. Um, yeah, okay. Okay. So they wanted us to do Lister's best practice and that just seemed a little mundane and overdone, so we decided to kick it up a notch and we're going to do touch on how and when to implement change in an inherited office because, you know, that's always fun. <laughs> All right, so we're making some disclaimers here. This session is not intended to direct listers or assessors to alter their grant list, but to instead encourage you to identify the listing practices utilized prior to your arrival and or so that you may be equitable. Identify inconsistencies among like parcels and whether it's warranted and identify areas of potential Im potential improvement and when the appropriate time for change might be. Hmm. So don't run back to your office and do everything that we tell you to do today. This is a theoretical conversation for your consideration. It's one of my favorite quotes since my early days as a town clerk. Huh. Uh, so prior to this, I was a town clerk treasurer and listener for the fine town of Montgomery, who's sitting in the back in the corner, gonna make faces at me. The most dangerous phase in, or phrase in our language is we've always done it this way. Yeah. We agree? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep doing it that way. And to a certain extent, that's what we're going to talk about, is there are certain things you can't really change midstream. You got to wait for that reappraisal because at a certain point, doing the wrong thing to everybody is more important than fixing it now. So questions we might want to consider are, what is the current inherited practice in your listers and assessor's office? What was done before you got there? Likely established five to 10 plus years ago, depending on how long your predecessor was there. What aspects may seem contrary to statute or PBR best practice per the listers handbook and the courses that we provide, or IAAO for that matter? When should we consider updating these practices? Is it right now if we can really capture every instance of this potential issue, or do we wait for a reappraisal and talk to our contractor? Here we have a nice little picture of our Lister handbook. Hopefully everybody in the room is familiar with this. If you're not, please call your district advisor or go to our website and search to print. Um, and we can provide a copy of these um, slides for you at the end of the class based on the email addresses that you put on that handy <coughs> sign sheet so be accurate and spelled clearly because you know, some handwriting is just not pretty. If you're one of my towns, you'll be sick of seeing the handbook because with every question I'm given, I give the answer in the page I found it in because I had to look it up in the handbook first. So I always forward that in an email too. Um, if you prefer not to have a printed copy because things change, it's really handy to just have a PDF copy on your desktop because you can search that PDF for, for language or words and it'll bring you to every instance that that particular phrase or word is used. That's a top tip. Control F is a search function. You can just, you're looking for contiguous. It'll search the entire handbook for the word contiguous and find you all the topics on it. It also makes you really good at learning how to spell the word contiguous. <laughs> yeah. My listener's office, when I first started, there was a sticky note that had it spelled out right there. Um, what else, what else? I can say, I think, pretty confidently, and I don't know if Christy's still in here, but I think amongst the district advisors, I would say a good 70 to 80% of the questions that we answer, we're going right here. We're doing that same thing. We're searching that term because we want to give you that source to be able to read it and in its context and save it for future use. Anything else on that one, Christy? No, I agree with you. How do you like that? I love it. <laughs> How do you like those apples? <laughs> All right, so where might you find some inconsistencies? Uh, so first we'll talk about the grand list, so that's your NEMRIC grand list module for the folks that are still using that. Uh, I know there are some other cameras that aren't as well used in the, or widely used in the town that might do things or <coughs> state, do it a little bit differently. But generally speaking, names with punctuation. My first name, for instance, has a hyphen in it. I don't put it on my business cards or anything because people think that that just means it's my nickname and so we go. And so we also have the St. Pierre's or anything that, that might have an apostrophe or other hyphen in it. What's the best practice? How do you want to do it? Abbreviations and addresses. So half of your roads are R-O-A-D. 
One of them is R-A-O-D because if it's mistyped, and then you have the R-Ds. We want to be consistent in those things. They make a difference when we're trying to do filters on the other end, and also with the VTPI conversion. <coughs> Ownership, taxpayer status, and category codes. These are definitely areas that I've seen personally um, that could use a little bit of attention. Um, particularly when parcels are subdivided, a lot of these things aren't readdressed at the time of sale, nor are they continued to be monitored throughout annual grant list maintenance, particularly taxpayer status. People are moving a lot these days. They might not sell their house, um, but that they may end up moving out of town or out of state and retain that ownership, so we want to keep these things fresh. Anything else there? Uh, I think description is the next one. That's a biggie. Parcel <coughs> descriptions. Parcel descriptions. Take it away. Uh, the big thing you always see acreage in the description and then you do a subdivision and you change it everywhere except in the description so the taxpayer gets a bill the bill is totally correct you only have 20 acres but that top of the tax bill still says 50 acres and they're upset um, it's easy to go through vet all of these is a description that you can do the hot keys and numeric and you can, yeah. so you can actually make it physically consistent by having five options and pressing a button you can only use the five options when i first started doing appraisals uh reappraisals the first job i was tasked with is cleaning up the 911 addresses uh you know getting rid of all the rd street road stuff just clean up your database it's worth taking the time on a rainy day I would assume that having all these things taken care of prior to a reappraisal rolling out might make your contractor a little bit happier too. Makes life easier. It makes you smile. It makes you smile. It makes you smile. Well, all right, there you go. Are we allowed to ask questions now or do we have to wait? No. No. <laughs> what do you got here? The ownership taxpayer status and category codes. Yes. Um, Joanne, my coworker and I, what, what frustrates us the most is we're going by this PTTR that is done by the attorneys. So up here they have the seller and the buyer, and they put the buyer, and they put a New York address, but down here it says what is the transfer or's use after, it says primary. Yes. So I say to her, you code it as an NS, because if they're not gonna give us a new mailing address, we're not gonna chase after these people and assume that the mailing address is the property address, because we have PO boxes. Right. So, that coding thing, and, and we got reamed out by one of our attorneys that if they declare homestead, it's their homestead. And we said, well, they didn't tell us their new mailing address, and we had it as NS. Yeah. So there's where we're, we're tired of chasing after these. I don't, I don't disagree with you at all. Uh, from the town clerk perspective back in the day to the lister perspective, those PTTR is generally, at least the ones that are, I'm seeing in the Northeast Kingdom, the attorney is not caring where, what their PO box is. Oh, I know. They're putting in the physical address of the property that they're purchasing. Yeah. Whether or not they're going to live there because it's right there at the tip of their fingers. No, they put New York. They didn't or New put, York. Okay, New York. Yeah. Um, so the other nice thing about Vermont for the time being, and hopefully for a long time, we have local control. Each office can set their own policy. I would say be consistent. Yep. Don't pick on the guy from New York, but not the guy from New York. Right, Hampshire. right. And we don't. So we just can only go with what we have. And we had the reverse before where they had the property address that they were buying, but down here it said it was going to be their second home. So, so um, I'm not sure if on the new printed copies of the PTTR, they still have the phone number and email address of the attorney at the bottom. If you have the time and will, you could shoot up an email address saying, Oh, well, we do, but we're tired of doing it. I We've know. got better things to do. <coughs> understand. Okay, thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. Yep. Just do it consistently. Bob, then. Yeah, we have a remedy for that. When one comes through like that, I got a form letter that just says, Welcome to Bradford. If, if the above address is going to be your mailing address for your tax bill or any relation with the town, do nothing. If not, please fill out the attachment. Change of address for a return and stamp self to just that below. There you go. We that's, found that's an option. Be proactive. To answer that, uh, there are some towns that actually have like a three-fold file or um, flyer that they'll put in an envelope and they will send them as a welcome letter. They don't tell them what their town clerk hours are, how to reach their listers, how to get to the select board meetings, library hours, other resources. 
how to register to vote, all of the things that would make a new taxpayer coming to town feel welcome and not forget to update their address. So the nice thing about that is when you put it in the mail at the time of transfer, if it's going to come back undeliverable, you're going to get it then. Or it might be the new tax, the old taxpayer that gets it because they have a forwarding address and you might get some communication that way. You could send that out with validation letters. Mm -hmm. Maybe to a sales validation letter, letters, yes, absolutely. Invaluable. Um, the best time to send those is when the transfer happens. So if your town clerk doesn't happen to get you those PTTRs until December because they're swamped with all their other duties that they have, make sure you're going in and checking that logbook to see what's coming through the door. So you know what to expect and maybe put in a letter at that time. Did you have something, Jen? We would put them in non-state and when they come in the town clerk's office and want to register to vote, he tells us. There you go. Force their hand. Make friends with your town clerks. <laughs> I had to be friends with myself, so. <laughs> All right, so what about in camera? Homestead and house site flags. Um, these can get out of whack pretty quickly, um, particularly if you have multiple people in the parcel or you're answering the phone a lot. You may forget to change the homestead house site flags when you're doing that data entry for that, that you know, tool shed out back or, or business use or the, the site improvements. They started renting the, the second dwelling on the house, so originally it could be part of the homestead, but now it can't be because it's rental purpose. So we wanna go through and we wanna make sure that those are correct on the dwelling. So the parcel itself, the outbuildings, site improvements, anything else? Check all your homestead flags, and, and if it is a property with only one home, one section, you can turn the homestead and house site flags on and then let the actual homestead <coughs> download be the trigger. It's better to have them say yes, yes, and then let the homestead apply that value than have them say no, not calculate that value, and you'll end up with an error down the road processing homesteads. So the homestead and house site flag are not about who is living, that taxpayer living in the house at that time. It's can this property reasonably be lived in as a full-time residence? You do the value once, hopefully at the time of reappraisal, but certainly when you're doing permit inspections for new houses, turn these flags on. You're gonna hit them with one change of appraisal for the assessment, the homestead, and the house site, and then when that tax rate flips, you don't have to send them another change of appraisal because you forgot to do those flags. Good. Building style and outbuilding types. We'll have Benton talk about this one. Um, it's good to have consistent building styles. We talked about this in our, uh, our data collection class. You can run comps. If you want to look at all the split levels or all the Cape style homes, you can do a filter in Microsoft, I'm sure the other CAM systems do, and pull up all of those property types. Do your own sales analysis that way. Um, there's probably 30, 35 L building types built into Marshall and Swift. Use the 10 most common ones, use them consistently. Um, you don't want to get too artistic with the data that you choose, because if you have two neighbors and they both have the same Amish shed, but one's a material storage building and one is a tool shed, you're going to start a fight. <laughs> Be consistent. Get your camera. Get your camera. Any questions there? Quality and condition grades, Benton. Uh, the same thing. All properties that are similar in construction, similar visually, if a you know reasonable person would walk up and think these two houses are the same type of house, have your grades be consistent. Uh, the graduation between grades, you know, if you go three, 3.25, we use a quarter, quarter grade delineation, <coughs> just be consistent with how you collect data. So 3.82? Probably one stairway. It might be the exact right dollar amount on that property, but uh, harder to defend. It comes down to defendability. I think somewhere in an earlier conference it was talking about uh, uh, doing your data collection, doing your appraisal, being ready for the appeal. You know, justify every step of the way. Make it something defendable. And we're going to tell you how to go and look for those types of inconsistencies. Sometimes it's just a, a keystroke error. You meant to hit five or seven five and you accidentally hit five seven. Land IDs, types, and grading. 
Um, order is important. In Microsoft, you have your IDs for outbuildings for land. It's uh, how they show up <coughs> in the actual cost sheet, uh, site improvements. If you're doing water sewer, keep that order. Water sewer, water sewer, if you have multiple on property. Land IDs, start with your site, then your residual acreage or site, your additional site, then your residual acreage. It's just easier to check your own work visually. Um, and then, you know, if that spring gets washed out and if you have to take it out of the middle, that's always fun. But yeah. try to be consistent, as consistent as you can for you your can, own sanity. You can tell what goes with which property that way. So three sections, three sets of site improvements. You would assume that the first two go with the first, the second two go with the second acquired or built structure, the third, and so on. So for property taxation purposes, per 32 PSA 4152A3, a parcel is defined as all contiguous land in the same ownership together with all improvements thereon. Everybody's favorite topic is contiguous parcels. So contiguous means that all land in the same ownership that touches at a point without consideration of highways, right of way, town line, river, or power line are all to be listed in your grant list under one taxable parcel. Nobody's fallen out of their chair or rolled their eyes or raised their hand. No, they all rolled their eyes. <laughs> they learned to do it inside. Okay. All right, so we know how much fun contiguous parcels cost for us, right? Do contiguous parcels then have a different value? When combining two or more parcels for taxation purposes, each property should, should, barring certain circumstances, maintain its value as determined by highest and best use. While structure values are easily replicated, economy of scale in your land schedule may result in a lesser total value depending on how you reflect that combination. No hands. So, for instance, what you got, Susan? I'm just gonna open my mouth. Open your mouth. That's question. So if you have two contiguous parcels, two side-by-side -side parcels, and they have two different tax bills, how do you fix that? How do you, how do you fix it? Yeah. We fix it before we get to a tax bill. Okay. So we, we want to think about it separate from the taxation part. We're looking at it from strictly from its value. Okay. You, if, if you bought a house next door to your own house, yeah. legally they must be listed contiguous under one parcel. So you'd have to take all of the elements out of the house you bought and put them into the record of the house you own. You have to inactivate, turn off the parcel next door you bought, and put all that value into your parcel. So are you combining the two? You are combining the two. So what about the boundary? It still exists. You can sell that other house. It's a legal loss whenever you want. Um, this is just for valuation listing purposes. You, know, you have, gotta keep in mind, you don't change the deeds. You're not changing the deeds. You're doing this for span numbers. Right. And so you're combining it. If there are two buildings, it's section one, section two. Right. But you're not changing anything except putting it together for tax purposes right. and for the span so numbers. The deeds exactly. do not change. Exactly. Yeah. Still legally separate entities. They so, just, for tax purposes, need to be So combined. what do you do with the land? So that's fine. So what if you have a grade one land and a grade point four land? We're going to talk about it. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to add one more thing. Make sure if you combine them, you save the one number you're no longer using in inactive file. Absolutely. But if you don't, they Mr. may He's split it up <clears throat> and you have no information from the one that they're selling. Right. To make sure you also keep all the information for that. In our um, mapping work, when that's combined, we show the, the uh, yes. number faded out a little bit on that parcel so we with know the, the dotted line. number was. Yeah, that's huge. And the nice thing that changed in Denmark, I don't know how many years ago now, more than I, I can count probably, you can't delete a parcel without a code. That means you're calling Chris Mealy. I don't know if you can call Ed. Maybe he's not going to answer because he's out yeah, in the field doing it. Yeah, or district advisor. And we're going to be like, well, why do you want to delete that parcel? We're going to have a very long conversation. There's also that contiguous box in the grant list. So your, your parcels that are turned off, all by rights, should point to 
where that value lives now. If your predecessor used that. <coughs> if you, yeah, well, there you go, inheriting the office. You can only go back so far. Bitcoin goes forward, yeah. and then look back. If, if you've inherited an office that did not previously use the transfer parcel button in your network program, mm -hmm. start using that part. Yeah. It won't hurt. Yeah. What you got in that? So we have two contiguous pieces of property, but they have a right of way that divides them. Does that make it still two pieces or one piece? If that per if the same entity owns both sides of the right of way, it's one parcel. Okay. Yeah. Right away. Without consideration line. of road, right of way, town lot, town line either. Yeah. So Mr. Bouvier, do you have one? Yeah. And the scenario you provided where there's a house and you bought that house. The house you're living in remains the parent parcel as well as the alpha parcel, correct? Yeah, yeah. The one, yeah, you have to pick your parent parcel carefully, but the one that the owner has already been in is the one you want to choose as your parent, typically. Um, yeah, I've seen some towns choose the biggest parcel, and that's the one they choose to maintain the span on. But if you have a taxpayer that's traditionally filing a homestead declaration on this 10 acre parcel, they buy this 100. Keep the, the span with the 10 because that's what they're filing their homestead declaration on. Otherwise, you're going to have to do that lister response. So if you were in this room a little while ago, you're going to be talking with Lisa Pinkus and Taxpayer Services about fixing that. What I do is I use that area of the com uh, combined mm -hmm. for the contiguous, but I also do not take the data from the other house and put it in with that, I, I just keep it as its value and I bring it over to the miscellaneous adjustment. That way the land stays the same value and the building stays the same value. There's some pitfalls. There are some pitfalls. Why would you combine a three acre and a two acre mm -hmm. when they're actually legally two separate parcels? You should have a highest and best use for that three and a highest and best use for that two. There's the value piece, but then there's parking the pieces of value in the right spot. So the land isn't broken out from the buildings in that instance. There are certain cases where commingling that number, because the miscellaneous adjustment just comes off the top, or does it come off the improvement side? It comes off, it, off, it's the, off top. the whole thing. The whole yeah. value is going to be the miscellaneous of 350 next door is going right to 350 on that miscellaneous, and I put a note, yep. miscellaneous adjustment equals value of parcel ID that is contiguous ownership. Be consistent, and I'm hoping yep. some of the things we're going to talk about yep. might give you some other, some alternatives. Because I think merging and combining, people are getting the merge and the combine yeah. Absolutely. very messed and up. And there's there are definitely some you know corner cases where they're purchasing a 0.15 acre lot that used to have a small home on it, but it doesn't conform to zoning anymore. Right. Then you get into a legal discussion. But so that's high as best use. Yeah, it would be better with the full. Right. You also have to be sure that you transmit your footprint because you could lose that when you're merging these parcels with APEC. So be very careful that you don't lose that. Don't lose your sketch. Yeah. 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 Do you still keep that other parcel ID that you're inactivating? I'm just thinking about mapping. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you're just turning the lights off. Okay. It still lives in the back of your grand list. It's just not getting a bill. Okay. You don't lose any of that information. Okay. If they ever want to do something, the same span comes back. Up. Exactly. Flip the lights back on, there. tax bills going out the but next one. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have one right here. One of the problems with doing with um, combining things with um, the miscellaneous adjustment is you're going to have to adjust. Uh, your homestead and house site because they don't that doesn't change that comes right off the top of your miscellaneous adjustment and somebody who has the house homestead yeah. on land is not going to get it current use certain yeah. outbuilding yeah. values right. won't be in the outbuilding right. fields there's, they're there's still getting their homestead balls. on their two acres and their how homestead yeah. not house site right. homestead is not going to be on there yeah it comes out the miscellaneous and the Microsoft adds up into the homestead but it doesn't mm -hmm. It overstates yeah. your house site value. Right. It shouldn't be getting one of the homes in the tax Right. So, additionally, I, and this is kind of a question, but a statement as well. So if, if you buy a property and you merge them and now you have a section two, but then you have acres other, but it's not a building lot site, and highest and best use would not be a building lot site, and we typically downgrade our acres other or 
not downgrade, but for additional building lot sites, the grade of the land goes lower for additional building lot sites. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. So when I think about that, I, I that adjustment to me would be difficult. But that again, that's how we're doing it. Well, I'm glad to say you're thinking about it. That's the key. So. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here. But ultimately, just because we have a new deed that has come into our office, this parcel is the same today <coughs> as it is tomorrow, as is this one, but now we have to put them one on one tax bill. And we have to figure out how to address that. Is there a difference in value because they merged? Probably not, um, barring some extreme circumstances like zoning and, and grandfather parcels. So let's go on to... Do you maintain a site value for each original parcel? Yes. It depends. But again, we want to be consistent. So part of the conversation might be, does this depend on whether the parcel is improved, the new purchase parcel is improved at the time of sale? You want to look at your files. You want to see how your predecessor did this. Whether you agree with it or not, you want to see if it makes sense to continue this, this practice. I think Christy, or Christy had an example the other day where a town accidentally put in everything as acres other. And every sale that came in was coming in $33,000 under or so because acres other is giving you a, your bulk land and it's not giving you a site value. Okay. Do the parent parcel and contiguous parcels being merged conform to zoning regulations? And is that going to make a difference in your opinion of value? or did it make a difference in opinion in your predecessor? So again, we're looking at this based on what was done in your office previously, identifying it, identifying inconsistencies, and when it might be implement change if you want to. Okay. I think I, in our office, we use the terms merged and contiguous in different ways, or in combined. If we have two, two parcels, they are combined for tax purposes, but they're not merged. Exactly. We've had people who have actually merged their properties, yes. mm -hmm. taken away that second parcel, taken away the, uh, the Absolutely. number for Change the everything. legal description. Merge, and I think people are getting confused between merge yep. and combined. Thank you. It would be nice to have one set terminology, but I would make the argument that <coughs> combined and merged kind of mean the same thing. No. Legally merged is a different thing. Yeah, because they're the deeds. They Legally. say they're merging yeah. these two properties. Right. But you need to decide what that means in your office. Yeah. Or I have actually had a taxpayer in the town that I come from decide they didn't ever want, they didn't want that extra value. They didn't intend to sell that other piece off. They came in with a deed that combined them all onto one deed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then it, it could probably still be parsed. Yeah. As long as but the deed is explaining that it is no longer to as long as, yes, as long as it's a, this particular person deep. didn't go that far, I just put them all on that, it, it, it didn't quite hit the mark. Yeah. But again, happened. also read the deed. Right. Well, and the linchpin being, if you're merging, you are getting rid of that right to subdivide, well, to not have to go through subdivision, and it's no longer presumed to be separately buildable. Right. Whereas right. if you're just buying the neighboring lot, there could be a developable site there, there's a big value there, so you got to know what what they're but, doing and why. But the deeds the deeds make it merged. Right. But just buying the parcel next door does right. not merge it. It's forfeiting their whatever grandfathered rights would have been there. You got to start from scratch, new subdivision, conform to zoning rules, all of that. We have about eight minutes left, so I don't want to shut the questions up. We're happy to stay and answer questions, but we do have quite a few slides left, and Benton wants to help you figure out how to get this info out of your camera so that you can start looking into these things. Um, so does parcel size play a role? So if you have a 10-acre parcel, say you're using a two-acre site as average and your bulk land is a 0.8, the neighboring parcel, all the same attributes except for the fact that it's 100 acres. And at the time of reappraisal, or amongst this discussion, you decided that at that number of acres, it was really a 0.7. Or it had some impaired land at the back, and so you were doing an adjustment for that. Does that size pay, play a role? Anything to add there? No. Okay. And did your reappraisal contractor recognize multiple sites as being reflective of fair market value, fair market value at your last reappraisal? your reappraisal is 10 years old, maybe at the time it didn't make sense to reflect that value. Today's market, it might. Probably does. 
And it means if it's been 10 years and you're still working on that little cross table, don't start recognizing them now for anything you spot. Just stay until the next reappraisal. Be consistent at this point. So how do you manage the combination of that bulk land? Do the original parcels reflect the same bulk land rate at the time of sale? If so, that's an easy consideration. You would assume that you'd make the whole thing 0.8, but then you get the economy of scale. If it's significant, you might want to consider making that a different grade. But make notes. Because the next listener that comes in once you've had enough and throw your hat, they're going to come in and say, well, they must have not meant to put a 0.9 on there. It really should have been a 0.8 like everybody else there. Notes and consistency, that's my theme. Does your town reduce or increase bulk land grades depending on the size of the parcel? Same conversation we just had. Does it make sense to have two bulk land IDs with different grades? So in that example, if you have one parcel that has 0.8 on their bulk and this parcel over here that has a 0.9, are you gonna average them and have one bulk? Are you gonna maintain two or are you gonna reconsider the whole thing? parts of your land like any of the other nuances with your property you have to grade for the different pieces of it yep. it's okay to split up that bulk land for different grades for different parts you just want to get the value at the end of the day within reason, within reason. you need to get those towns like the Middlebury Cornwall situation you've got big tracts of land but you've also got 700 acres of swamp land literally swamp land yeah you got to break that out you just yeah. have to Having said that, you're not that good that you should break out 15 different types of land. No. You're just yeah. not. Yeah. You're just not. It's not a and it's something rush. to argue about. The more you do, it's more to argue about. So don't do five or six or seven of them if you don't need them. You might be trying to do the right thing. Yeah. <coughs> At the end of the day, it's not going to make that huge of a difference in your overall value, and it's going to be hard to defend. So identifying potential inconsistencies. Before you begin, you'll need to identify exactly what issue it is that you hope to filter from your brand list or camera and what data points might be helpful. Do you want the parcel ID? Do you want the name? Do you want the acres? Parcels with more than one dwelling and one site value. Why might that be handy, Benton? Um, if you're combining up parcels, you want to be able to identify whether or not they're separately saleable or is there is there one site for two homes? There's a big dollar difference there. This is going to help you identify cases where it wasn't done consistently. It's not going to address the improved parcel merge with the unimproved parcel because we're only looking at the, the number of sections. That's the filter point that we're going to be using. But it's a place to start. Parcels with more than one dwelling and only one set of site improvements might be reasonable. They might share them, but they might not. So maybe at when you're merging those, combining those onto one parcel, you forgot to add the site improvements. Parcel appraised with only a low land value, that's that AC other. Is it really undevelopable, or did we just miss a step? Big dollar difference there. We clicked a five instead of a six, or vice versa. And parcels with inconsistent land grading, that's the .57 versus the .75 that we did with a keystroke error. We want to see if we have some of those going on at the grant list. Is that that's probably helpful for folks when they come in to do a reappraisal looking at land schedule? Set up your recipe card. Yep. Break it out for different land attributes. For the potential issues we just identified for review, you'll run the following exports from Cama. We're going to run. Four. We're going to give you the information based on the email addresses that you, uh, you've entered there so you can take it back and actually run these out of your camera program. So the first report we want to run is parcels with AC other specifically in land ID number one. We're going to run parcels with only one land ID in multiple sections. Parcels with multiple sections and three or fewer site improvements or two if you don't use landscape and all parcel ID grades. That way we can get those inconsistent grades. And now, we'll hop over to like Benton. To try to plug it in and do one with you, but like she said, we can email 
a quick how to. Right. Which cameras are you doing? Uh, this is Microsoft. Microsoft. Unfortunately. Does anyone use a non Microsoft camera? Yeah, just the people that ask. Just the people that ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, are you? So there's two parts of this. What we're doing is an export. First is filtering the data, filtering all of our camera information to narrow down what we want to look at, and then running an export, choosing the fields from camera we want to make a report with. Can so, uh, Ed, how do we do the zoom? Does the zoom work on this? Go to Ed, you have zoom. Make it 250. Yeah. So we go to tools, export. Is that any better? No. no. We're going to send you a how to, too. I think it's and you can always call that. You can drag the bottom one corner. Hold the bottom. That looks good. Oh my gosh, look at that. Well, that would have been easy, Ed. Yeah, come on, speak up. <laughs> you made him go through all that for nothing. He might have done it on purpose. He did do it on purpose. This is the filter button up here. Looks like a Tetris square. I pre-saved a couple of these, but let's see. What did I do? So multiple sections. So I want to make a filter. Add, what am I looking for? I'm looking for section. Don't panic, we're giving you these instructions. This is this little drop-down list is every single box in Microsoft. Sorted alphabetical. Sorted alphabetical by by tab. Yeah, I don't want to say the word section too many times. So in this case, I want to go section ID is greater than or equal to two. Alternatively, you can hit value and here's everything loaded into camera. The biggest property in this database has four sections. So I click OK. I count it. There's 44 records. That sounds good to me. I've set my filter. So now I want to make a report and choose what I'm looking for. In this case, all the properties with more than one section. And I want to do a little analysis of the land IDs. So I pre-saved this one to make, a, to make an export report. You grab these over here, you click the arrow, you slide them over here. Anything that lives on this side becomes a part of your report. And you can rearrange them. And you can rearrange them. But only once you have to save it in that <coughs> file before you exit and try to export. What she means by that is click that button and then you can have it added to your drop down here. Can you reorder after you've saved? Is that what you're so? saying? You can reorder it after you yeah. save it, but then you still have to save it with that exact profile if you want to export that exact way. Or it goes away. It Why am I not getting it? It doesn't retain the filter, though. You have to remember that. It lied to you. <laughs> Let me try a different one. You knew this was going to happen, right? Typically, this would populate with all the filter info. I have an active filter. Section ID is greater than or equal to 2. You need to go back to choose which profile you want. Over here? In the bottom, right. You're talking about site improvements there. And you're using the filter for parts for sections. Well, they're two separate things, the filter and the report. But normally this would populate with data. Right, if you look at your set, the things that you're choosing from. Yeah. At least something should show up. You gotta pick the section ID and bring it over, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you don't have section ID. You gotta bring it over to that choose field and process. So you don't have section ID in there. You're you're factoring, you're filtering something that's not in your report. That actually shouldn't make a difference. If yeah, I... you're filtering for something that's not a variable in your report, so there is nothing. Hmm. There's no land IDs in your fields. So here we go, nothing's going to show up with one or more, or ten. Go to your bottom box. There it is. Blue. Section ID up to the top, second one. And go one. up. Use your little arrow up. Second from the top. I put it in the left. Mm -hmm. 
Where do you want me to go? Go up. Yeah, I was looking for that. Right here. Yeah. The filter in the report are actually separate. You don't need to have the thing in the report to filter by that thing. Yeah. Maybe you can have that screen come back in. Yeah. I swear it works. It's something. We believe you. It's a very simple 47 step process. We'll try something different. Try a land filter. All active parcels with one or fewer land IDs. And I'll do a land export. There it is. And then you choose how you want to export it. How do you want to get it on the other end? Excel file, unless you're fancy. And I'm going to choose this to go onto my desktop. tells you what each header of the Excel column will be. Right in here to be test. And of course it didn't save to my desktop. <laughs> it's in the report on top left. Oh, yeah, it it's so in bad. Excel. You can't see me pointing here. Wait, turn uh, this to Christy. Yeah, she picks on me for that all the time. Get yeah, you point? Yeah, point to the screen rather than second. I think that might be it. So the reason that you want to print out that sheet that pops up and says this is going to be the col the columns that are there, you'll notice that it doesn't name the columns for you. And if you don't have that handy and you have a lot of columns, you might forget. You want to make sure that the labels are consistent so you know what you're you're looking at. And that report also tells you exactly where it's been saved at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So that that actually is quick and dirty. Run through a variety of reports. We'll send you the instructions <laughs> on the four types that we, it's actually only three reports because we can do multiple things with one of them. We'll get those in your hands so that you can go back to your office in all of your free time because everybody's looking for extra things to do with the listener's office um, and start playing around with it. I promise it's a powerful tool when it actually works. <laughs> so again, just bring this full circle. Do not go back to your office and start changing everything in your brand list based on what Benton and I talked about today, or even the results of these, therefore, discussion purposes to make sure that you're carrying on and being equitable with what your predecessors have done, and also to help inform your reappraisal contractor when they come in the things that you're seeing and might want to address. That could really make a big mess, though, if you go in and you find like over a dozen, and then you have to change these things to make them equal? Or you write to your select board and say, I found 85 errors that have potential cost or effect of this. Let's get a reappraisal contractor in the door and clean this up so we can start fresh. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah, because they're going to say yes every time. Yeah, sending out yeah, those right. new <laughs> values to those 12 people going, what? It's been like this for how long? So I did finally find it. Here is all of those parcels in that report. Here's your calc method, your site or acreage, and then your type, building lot, acreage other, your total. So a 1-1, one, one, that's a site building lot. 7-5, that's a current use calculator thing. So you can filter all the current use calculators out by using that drop down and applying the filter in this program, not in Kama. There is a parcel that's only a 2-5, so there's a acreage other undevelopable lot or it has land in a contiguous town or could have I'm land in a contiguous sites. town it does in fact have land in a this may or may not be an old lincoln database it is. <laughs> she is the lister for um, so there will be no mistakes to find in this there to be, be sure <laughs> just don't look uh acreage total site building lot you can do this for a myriad of things. You can do a report and find all of the AC other in town. You can do a filter for 
multiple sections, and then a report for site improvements. And then you'll get a list of every property with two houses, two or more houses, and then you can run down this list and look to see if there are two sets of site improvements, a water and a sewer on each property, or if there are only three total, but there should be four, there should be a note as to why. They share a septic, they share a well. Um, you could do this across all of your quality grades and see the trend of all of the quality grades on your properties in camera, or all of your land grades. See if you're being consistent, or see if you have a land grade 752. It's just a way to find consistency. You know what's scary and helpful is like doing your percent completes. That's you do a percent complete report, run it every year. You got to look at it. Go knock on those doors. If you're doing inspections, you can pull a street report, get the name and the parcel ID of every house on that road. It makes going down the line doing inspections easier. You can get creative with it. 